So something that I still have to research on and read up on is, is why exactly uh, did governments all over the world uh, focus their efforts and funding on re uh, deep geological repositories instead of uh, channeling all those effort, all those resources into actualizing and building generation four reactors. So the idea has already been around since the early 2000s. And, and, after, 20, and after 20 years, we still do not have a commercially working generation four reactor. So that is, still, that, I still ha that is something that I still have to uh, check why they chose to do that. Uh, intuitively, I think they just wanted a quick fix for the radioactive waste problem. But at the end of the day, if you just look far, far enough, if you, if you think far enough, you would have seen, people would have seen that uh, having generation four reactors would have been much more advantageous, would have been much more, uh, would, be, would have been better for the nuclear energy industry as a whole. Because if we had a working, let's say, sodium fast reactor right now, th there's a very big chance that the argument for radioactive waste, uh, the radioactive waste problem would already be, would have already been answered. There would be no more, there, there would be, uh, no, no more anti-nuclear sentiments, citing specifically that reason because we've already solved the waste problem. But alas, this is the situation that we are in. We have repositories instead of uh, generation four reactors. We have to uh, make do with what we have. You're listening to Rome is in Manila, a podcast with the pandemic as its ground zero. I am Rome Juanetas. I am not your friend yet. Listen as we transcend through space and time discussing misadventures, noise, and learnings with guests who are learning and learning and learning things. Tune in. Stop being a stranger. Be a friend. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rome is in Manila. Today, I'm joined by by Don, a friend from college, and we'll be talking about things we didn't talk about before. So yeah, uh, right now I'm giving the chance to Don to introduce himself. Hello, Don. How are you doing? Uh, could you tell us a bit about yourself, how, uh, who you are, what you're doing, your interest? And yeah, it's your time to tell us anything you want to tell about yourself. So hello, Rome. I hope you're having a pleasant day. I'm doing fine over here. So as a brief introduction, I am Don Lawrence Carl Fernando, a nuclear engineering student at University Paris-Saclay in France. I'm currently about to start my second year and specialize in nuclear reactor physics and engineering. So prior to this, I studied chemical engineering at the University of the Philippines, Deliman. Uh, I went on to work at Petron, Bet Petron Batan Refinery for three and a half years in the energy engineering department where I was mainly tasked with monitoring fuel-fired equipment, optimizing the fuel network, and calculating product losses. So right now, I am currently occupied in finding solutions to climate change. Uh, we are hard-pressed to answer this problem, and our generation may very well be the last one that lives to their 80s and 90s if no solutions are implemented soon, unfortunately. So with that in mind, I chose to transition to a career in nuclear engineering in the hopes of contributing to the research and drive to save the world. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's that's yeah. That's a lot of uh, like it's a heavy introduction. And yeah, thank you for introducing yourself and your background. Um, yeah, uh, Don and I were classmates, batchmates in college. We studied chemical engineering together. Yes. And then you went on to work in the refinery, right? Yes. And now you're studying nuclear engineering in the University of Paris. Exactly. Fire secondly. Okay, cool. So nuclear engineering to save the world. And you mentioned climate change, right? Okay, yes. So I'm, uh, that's actually very interesting. Uh, I don't know much about the intersection between climate change and nuclear engineering. So could you tell us about that? Okay, so before I delve into that, I think it would be best to uh, go a bit over what my motivation was for being here in for being a nuclear engineer nuclear engineering student right now and right. why I chose this career path. Okay, go so on. of That's course cool. we're both Filipinos and throughout our childhood climate change has always been a pressing issue. 
We face countless of storms every year and once in a while. We experience exceedingly devastating, devastating ones, uh, such as Typhoon Fengshen, or locally known as Frank in 2008, Typhoon Katsana, locally known as Ondoy in 2009, and notoriously Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Yolanda in 2013. Mm -hmm. So each of these storms always highlighted the perils of over, over, over dependence on fossil fuels. But as late as 2019, uh, the national gover government is still pushing to build more coal-fired power plants, unfortunately. So early on, personally, I wanted to help in setting things right. Mm. Uh, in high school, eventually, I realized that pursuing an engineering career will help me accomplish that goal. So I chose chemical engineering as my first choice for the University of the Philippines, Diliman in 2010. And fortunately, I got accepted into the program. So admittedly, at that time, it wasn't clear to me yet how I would go about uh, tackling the prob problem of climate change after I graduated. I decided to focus first on my studies and then worry about the future during the last stretch of my undergraduate years. Uh, eventually, I got employed in Petron Bataan Refinery as part of a scholarship contract. Yes, I recognize that I ended up working for an oil and gas company, which is a big contributor to climate change. I know the, I know the irony in that, but I wanted to take that opportunity for several reasons. Mm. So first, I wanted to see chemical engineering in action. So I believe that learning is not uh, limited to the academe. And to this day, I still believe that a refinery is one of the best places to witness every aspect of chemical engineering. And I was not disappointed. Secondly, and more importantly, I wanted to know what I can do to make the industry cleaner. Mm. So from 2016 to 2018, when I worked there, I participated in studies that aimed to optimize the fuel usage of the refinery. Not only did we reduce operating expenses, but we also alleviated air pollution uh, with regards to SOX and NOX. There have also been some efforts to use cleaner fuels as well and upgrade firing equipment, but at the end of the day, we're all still dealing with fossil fuels. We're still emitting carbon dioxide, no matter how clean the fuel becomes. Right. So unfortunately, those are, I realized eventually that those are the limits of what I could accomplish there. Uh, ideally, you, you would be able to implement or propose the implementation of carbon capture and sequestration equipment, or CCS for short, mm. to eliminate those carbon dioxide emissions. But unfortunately, uh, from what I've experienced, justifying the installation of CCS is close to impossible. Uh, there are long-standing concerns and skepticism about its sustainability and, more importantly, the economic viability of its applications. After all, uh, when it comes to any industry, money is a very important aspect. Right. So, and refinery expansions would like to focus more on the production of high-value streams such as gasoline, diesel, petrochemicals, and so on. So unless the government intervenes and passes a law that requires CCS, there is nothing that me and my department can do about that particular aspect of, em of CO2 emissions. So uh, facing that dead end eventually led me to nuclear energy. So it wasn't always nuclear energy that I had, in, that I had my eyes set on, mm. but the technical aspect of nuclear energy is something that always piqued my interest. So as I continued, continued my research on it a few years ago, I see this now as the correct path for me. Mm. So nuclear energy can be divided into two main categories. We have nuclear fission, which involves breaking large uh, nuclei into smaller ones to release energy, and nuclear fusion, which is the opposite. They're joining very light nuclei uh, to convert some of, those ma some of the mass into energy. So they are both attractive industrial in research areas due to their capability of producing large amounts of energy with fewer negative environmental impacts. So nuclear fission, for first, first and foremost, is capable of generating as much energy as gasoline or diesel for a significantly smaller amount of fuel. Uh, you, what you usually produce with a barrel of oil can be is equivalent to what nuclear fission produces with just several grams of uranium. So imagine how much uh, space you'd be able to save, how much uh, more savings you'd have on the fuel, and so on. 
Mm -hmm. So, like renewable energy sources, nuclear fission reactors do not directly produce carbon dioxide emissions. I say directly mm -hmm. because during uh, the building stage and the end of life stage, when you're scrapping the reactor, uh, inevitably with how the with how our, the industries work today, you can't help but emit CO2 for the meantime, unless you've all transitioned to just purely non-CO2 energy sources. Mm -hmm. So, but during its operation, nuclear fission reactors do not directly produce CO2. And that's very important. So not mm. only does it provide clean energy, it also serves as a viable candidate for replacing fossil fuels entirely as the base load in a country's energy generation mix. Mm. So the next one that I would like to talk about is nuclear fusion, which is even safer and more promising. Mm. It produces more energy than fission per mass of fuel fuel with even less radioactive byproducts. The feared meltdown that can happen with nuclear fission power plants is very unlikely or actually it cannot occur. It cannot occur, yes. It cannot occur with fusion reactors. So unlike nuclear fission, which has self-sustaining chain reactions, uh, fusion, reactor, fusion reactions are not self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. So the moment that your the moment that your reactor conditions deviate from your allowable operating range, the reactor will just stop immediately. So you will not get a meltdown. Mm -hmm. So selecting the appropriate reactor materials and creating stable plasma confinement are some challenges faced in designing and building experimental fusion reactors. So research all over the world is uh, in progress, uh, they're also building several experimental fusion reactors. Some of those, uh, some of the notable ones are the IER Tokamak, funded by the European Union, uh, United States, Japan, and other countries. It's located here in France and is set to be operational by 2025 at the earliest. Uh, the Wendelstein 7X Accelerator in Germany. Uh, housed in the Max Planck Institute of Plasma Physics and the National Ignition Facility of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the U.S. However, however, researchers have not yet overcome all of the challenges present in initiating fusion, reacto fusion reactions, sustaining them, and exceeding break-even operation. What I mean by break-even is uh, the power generated by the fusion reactor should exceed the power input to sustain the fusion reaction. And none of the, uh, that has not yet been demonstrated uh, by these uh, experimental reactors and sustained for, for a long period of time. Mm. So as a result, what we currently have now on a commercial and industrial scale are only nuclear fission power plants. Mm. So from this point onwards, when I say nuclear energy, I am solely referring to nuclear energy derived from nuclear fission. fission. Okay. Because we don't we don't have fusion we don't have fusion yet at the moment. Okay, okay so despite all of its advantages, uh, I gave a brief overview just now. Mm. Uh, nuclear energy is still faced with a lot of controversies True. due to its radioactive waste problem, and of course the major nuclear di disasters we've experienced so far. Uh, despite it being part of the solution to climate change. So fears regarding nuclear fission surfaced due to three major disasters, uh, the Three Mile Island incident in, uh, I think, 1979, Chernobyl in 1986, and the Fukushima Daiichi disaster recently in 2011. Mm. So the second one, Chernobyl, even contributed to preventing the Bataan nuclear power plant, which is coincidentally very near Petron Bataan refinery right. from ever being operational. So that's how powerful uh, sentiment can be. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I find personally, I find this stigma to be illogical because any other industrial accident, such as the Texas City refinery explosion in 2005 and the Deepwater Horizon disaster in 2010, mm -hmm. could be equally or even more catastrophic. So mm -hmm. from an engineering perspective, all industrial processes will, will have inherent risks. Right. And that is why we, we implement uh, engineering solutions to prevent those accidents from occurring. So even in the face of such enormous catastrophes and more frequent accidents in the oil and gas industry, a lot of nations continue to rely on fossil fuels to provide the majority of their fuel requirements today. 
So I, I recognize that nowadays there is a movement towards uh, green energy, towards renewable energy. But when I was applying for this, uh, for this MS, mm -hmm. uh, the movement wasn't really that quite strong yet. So a lot mm -hmm. has happened in the past years to change that. So to understand why and how ener nuclear energy can be saved, we must dissect the causes for those three major nuclear energy disasters. Mm -hmm. So from the sequence of events and the ensuing investigations, it is clear that uh, violations of maintenance procedures, flaws in the design of the reactor and its control system, or both, are the causes for the meltdowns. And it makes sense, uh, again, from an engineering perspective, uh, any, any industrial process can be made safe, unless, of course, you uh, disregard certain procedures or some standards, and you end up with a process that is uh, going to be hazardous. Mm -hmm. So the main takeaway from these is that nuclear energy is safe and clean when the proper designs, the design standards and operation procedures are followed. So while fission waste is radioactive, containment methods have been proved to prevent exposure in any way. So right now, we have uh, several facilities that allow storing of spent fuel for several decades until the radioactivity, radioactivity has been largely reduced. We also have geological, deep geological repositories uh, for the disposal of high-level nuclear wastes where they will be stored for centuries because uh, the half-lives of high-level nuclear waste uh, spans hundreds and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So they will be kept in those repositories where, where they will not be touched or be in contact with anyone for, for a very long time, basically, right. for, for lifetimes. Yes. So, however, what I find more exciting is the advent of Generation 4 fission reactors, which emphasized increased safety, sustainability, and energy efficiency. So for additional context on the name or label, why is it why it's called Generation 4? Mm -hmm. uh, the pressurized and boiling water reactors, those are the, do, the two main types of reactors that we have now. Those are termed as Generation 3 and Generation 3 plus reactors. So Generation 4 reactors are the next uh, batch, next set of reactor designs that we have uh, in plan. And those are very different from what we currently operate. Uh, and several of them, what is amazing is that several of them can actually consume and operate on existing nuclear fuel waste. So unlike, unlike repositories, which only remove nuclear waste from the picture, mm -hmm. Generation 4 reactors can eliminate them as well, and more importantly, extend the viability of nuclear energy for several more centuries. High-level nuclear waste still contains uh, a large amount of fuel mm -hmm. that can be consumed and, and transformed into energy but we opt not to do so because of uh, structural issues with the fuel. So despite its large, so to sum it up, despite its largely negative image to the common citizen, I firmly believe that nuclear energy can pave the way for a sustainable and prosperous future. This is why uh, I plan to pursue a PhD focusing either on generation for reactors or nuclear fusion right after I finish my MS. So I hope I was able to explain uh, my line of thinking with why I chose this career. Yes, and actually that's like, for, for me, that's kind of a lot of thing to digest in. But yeah, I, I appreciate that you shared, uh, starting from your motivation, like how, how and why you got into chemical engineering and then how your line of thinking changed, like from understanding just climate change and then working through the refinery and understanding uh, getting a bigger picture of the industry of energy generation and yes. now you're studying nuclear engineering so uh, based on your explanation now i kind of understand how climate change is actually related to nuclear engineering but w would you want to add more like um i'm actually very curious because you're now studying in Paris, right? And then you plan to study further. You plan to stay PhD still in nuclear engineering or nuclear fission, nuclear reactor. Um, I'm sure you plan to implement that in the Philippines when you get back or you want to have an opinion on it, right? Yes. 
<laughs> so, do you, oh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go um, ahead. Do you have any idea about the current sentiment of the Department of Energy in the Philippines with regards to anything nuclear? Actually, just very recently, uh, there was news about President Duterte uh, giving an order, I think. Mm. Can I call it an order? I'm not sure if it's technically called an order, but it asked, he asked uh, the Department of Energy, I think, to consider or analyze the viability of nuclear energy in the Philippines. That news came out just one or two weeks ago, I think. So... Uh, at least the national government itself is considering the possibility of finally having a nuclear energy program. So, however, uh, the first thing that I did was, since it's Facebook, it came out on Facebook. Right. The first thing that I did was to check the comments. Mm -hmm. And that's where I saw that the sentiment is still pretty much the same as it was for other countries that mm -hmm. do not have a nuclear energy program. It's 50-50. Some mm -hmm. are... Uh, some some of some some people uh, are advocating for it. Mm. Some are not, and that's to be expected. Some and the, the the major thing that I saw, the major trend that I saw from all of the comments is that some of them are equating having a nuclear energy nuclear power plant, nuclear mm. fission power plant, to nuclear weapons, which is incorrect. Mm. So. Just to clarify that now for all who's going to, for everyone who's going to be watching this uh, podcast, uh, a nuclear fission power plant cannot explode like a nuclear bomb. Mm. So f nuclear fuel only has around three to five percent uh, fissile material, so uranium, plutonium, and stuff. But a nuclear bomb requires at least 80 percent, ninety percent enrichment. So it's impossible. It's it's physically impossible for a nuclear bomb for a nuclear power plant to explode like mm. a nuclear uh, bomb. Right. So 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 the sentiment is fifty fifty, and I guess that's going to be part of what I want to accomplish in this new career path. Uh, it's been a big problem of nuclear energy, the the advertisement, the marketing, the PR, however you want to call it. Mm. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not going as well as we hope. Uh, as we hope for, uh, some people are still against nuclear energy, understandably, mm. especially because of the recent uh, disaster with Fukushima. But again, uh, from an engineering perspective, if we, if we are able to express our ideas to to a common citizen, uh, even better uh, to explain what happened, explain what caused it, and explain what we can do. I think it's going to be better for nuclear energy. It's going to progress the uh, the industry more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful that maybe in several in, in a few years the Philippine government will officially open up uh, its nuclear uh, a nuclear energy program mm -hmm. once again because we already had one before with the nuclear power plant. However, the plant was never operated because of several reasons. Right. Uh, and as part of my career goals that I set, uh, if if we if at least within ten years after I finish my PhD, air energy program in the Philippines, I will personally uh, come back to help and start it, and as in lobby the law, debate with the senators, uh, attend the hearings, whatever it takes. Uh, to pass that law and that, and finally jumpstart the nuclear energy industry in the Philippines because it is such a waste that we don't have one. The fuel is significantly cheaper than coal, than oil and gas. Mm. And imagine what would imagine how uh, imagine what uh, the the government can accomplish with having cheaper electricity. We would our taxes would be diverted to more important things. Right. Provided, of course, that the taxes are spent well. Yeah. <laughs> and the Philippines would hopefully probably be, be in a more uh, prosperous situation if we had access to nuclear energy. Mm, yes. Thank you very much for sharing that. And yeah, I think um, educating the mass, the Filipino people, with regards to nuclear energy generation is something that, that we could like put a focus on so that um, they will better understand rather than just having uneducated sentiments like 
like yes. what they have right now. I see. Um, actually, I, I've I've noticed a trend currently in the Philippines that um, solar energy is actually becoming more and more popular in the Philippines these days. Um, w- would you have any comment or opinion on that? It's not just in the Philippines, actually. Solar energy is experiencing a lot of uh, reductions in cost all over the world right now. Mm. Uh, citizens are adapting uh, installations for their houses. They're installing solar panels on the roof. And personally, I find no problem in that. Uh, for Because at the end of the day, nuclear energy and renewable energy are both uh, carbon-free, res- carbon-free energy sources. They're, from my point of view, and I believe, I strongly believe that they're not supposed to be competing against each other. Right. Uh, the main enemy, or, well, enemy, enemy, the main enemy, the main problem is oil and gas. It's not renewable versus re- renewable energy. It's nuclear and renewable versus oil and gas. So I'm perfectly fine with uh, the hype or the progress that renewable energy is getting. But all I want is that we should also not forget the, the capability and the advantages that nuclear energy could also bring to the picture. Because nuclear, uh, renewable energy also has its uh, problems as well. It's very intermittent. It requires batteries to be functional, uh, to be uh, reliable rather. And... Uh, those shortcomings can easily be fulfilled by nuclear energy in some scenarios. Hmm. Okay, I see. Um, given that we already had the uh, Bataan nuclear power plant in the past, is there any way that it could be salvaged or like booted up again? Or... Um, I actually, before I left the Philippines for my MS, I actually uh, participated in a, tra- in a two-week training by the PNRI, and our last activity for the two for those for the program was to have was to visit the Bataan nuclear power plant. And wh- what I saw inside was that it is practically still pristine. It's very very clean. It's it's even cleaner and more orderly than. What, we, what I saw in the refinery, as in all mm-hmm. the wiring is laid out properly, there's barely any corrosion and so on. It's well kept, well maintained. However, my main concern was that uh, the control room is already very outdated. So okay. at, the, at, at the very least, from what I saw, uh, we would need to upgrade the entire control and instrumentation system of Bataan Nuclear Power Plant just to have it operational again. And of course, you also have to perform lots of mechanical checks to check, to, to see if all the seals are working fine, if all the valves are working fine, the exchangers, the turbines, and so on. So I think it would, there's a big possibility. I am not, I, I'm not sure yet. I haven't checked the figures. I haven't checked the reports, but there's a big possibility that overhauling Bataan nuclear power plant would be just as expensive as building a new one. Mm. So, so I am not sure where the new location would be, but uh, as as time progresses, of course, the costs for overhauling Bataan nuclear power plant would keep increasing. Right. So if we wait, if we wait ten, twenty more years before we have a nuclear energy program finally in the Philippines, by then the costs of uh, operating Bataan nuclear power plant might already be far higher than the costs of just having a new, of, of just building a new power plant instead. Mm, I see. Wow, that's interesting. And as, a, a, as an additional point, the fuel, the nuclear, the, the, the fuel rods of Bataan nuclear power plant are no longer there. I think we've sold them uh, uh, at least 15 years ago mm. to some other company who needed them. So we don't even have the fuel there anymore to just operate it. Mm. So. I see. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge about the current status of Bataan nuclear power plant. And yeah, you've shared a lot about nuclear energy and all of this. And thank you very much. I think today by listening to you throughout this dialogue, this conversation, I was able to better understand how nuclear energy works and how it could be a solution to a lot of uh, climate change related problems. So yeah, I'm very thankful for, for you for sharing that. Um, 
Now, uh, since you've been studying nuclear energy for quite some time, I'm curious if you've had any eureka moments while studying or anything that you've learned recently that had a very big impact on you as a person. So I, I, pre I slightly preempted already my answer to that question. So okay. <laughs> during our first semester, we primarily focused on the core subjects of the course. So that would be materials engineering, uh, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, and so on. However, for the second semester, we began discussing auxiliary, I would call auxiliary, mm. but equally important subjects as well, such as energy economics and energy production and storage technologies. So in those subjects, I found what is perhaps the most important lesson I've had so far in this new career path of mine. Mm. As you can already tell, I am thoroughly convinced that nuclear energy is part of the solution to climate change. Mm. But however, before the previous semester, I even considered nuclear energy to be the sole answer to the problem. I disregarded everything else. Oh. So then came our lessons tackling the different kinds of renewable energy and storage methodologies. So my group in one of our classes, I think in energy economics, we were even tasked uh, to make a presentation on the competition between nuclear and renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So after all those lessons that we've had and the research that my group mates and I did, I've learned and realized that nuclear energy in the, indeed plays a role that is just as important as nuclear energy. It mm -hmm. even holds a more favorable position right now, as I've said earlier with the support it receives from most governments and citizens, and the subsidies uh, several projects receive right now. So combined with storage technologies such as batteries, uh, the intermittent nature of renewable energy can be dampened. So this further means that renewable energy can be uh, reliably used as a base load in several countries, especially those that do not have the capability to support a nuclear energy program yet, and especially in far-flung regions as well. So this is something that is already being done in the Philippines. Mm. Reading about it on a wider or global perspective is really eye-opening. So at the end of the day, as I've said again earlier, mm. both nuclear and renewable energies have their advantages and drawbacks. However, again, both are carbon-free technologies that should be working hand-in-hand -hand to solve the problem of climate change. They should not be uh, competing against each other, but I guess competition is inevitable when you're talking about costs. Right. Uh, and research progress. So uh, one of my friends told me that the proper term should not be competition, but co-opetition, something. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's, it's technically still a competition, but it should be something that uh, uh, what do you call, stokes the flame for, the re for both industries as well. It should be something that uh, progresses both and not mm. just completely drown out one in favor of the other. True. So that is my biggest learning so far, and that has, uh, that affected uh, a major line of thinking that I had even before I pursued this uh, degree. Right. Okay. That's that's really amazing because you're you're now telling us that yeah these are like on the same line of energy generation industry, but they don't have to compete with each other because in fact they're solving the same problem, which is yes. Yeah, helping climate change, still generating energy for all of us, but no or very negligible carbon emission. Is it really zero carbon emission? Or uh, no, just... uh, no uh, when they're operating, it's really zero. But again, mm -hmm. when you're building the solar panel, when you're building the nuclear reactor, when you're mining the uranium, you're producing mm -hmm. carbon emissions. It's not, okay. it's not directly attributed to their operation, but it's more... Uh, on building and as well at the end of life as well when you're uh, scrapping the reactor you're reuse uh, uh, recycling the panels and so on okay so thank you for clarifying that so there's still carbon footprint but it's usually before the operation and probably and it's after, yes. before and after and probably it's negligible as compared to uh, if it's negligible i'm not yet sure <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, I, I i haven't i haven't devoted enough time to studying the upstream nature of mm -hmm. nuclear energy and uh, uh, as for renewable energy as well. So yeah, I'm not okay. sure. Okay, no worries. Thank you for that. Probably we can discuss that in the future when you <laughs> know further about that. And, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe, perhaps. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And I, I think this will be my last question for you for today. So um, based on this previous how many minutes do we have? Maybe 30 minutes of discussion. I've noticed that you are really deep into this study that you're doing. Like, you know everything that you're talking about. And it, it's not just your brain that's on it, but it's also your heart. So I'm curious if you have perhaps um, words of advice to people who are also studying, uh, maybe studying in college or maybe they're pursuing um, higher degrees, like taking MS, PhD, if you have any word of advice for them on how they can like face head on whatever they're studying or learning. Okay, so uh, for students that are doing online classes nowadays due mm -hmm. to the pandemic, uh, my first advice would be to make the most out of the extra time that you originally allotted for packing and traveling. So personally, I have a tendency to sleep late at night when studying. Mm -hmm. I find it quite difficult to break the momentum once I finally understand uh, a really hard topic or when I am midway through solving a difficult problem. So what happens is I end up sleeping at 12 midnight or 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. So the, the transition to online classes that happened during the second half of my last semester gave me more time to rest as I don't need to wake up as early. Uh, I usually needed an hour to prepare myself and travel to the university. And of course, going home as well consumed about the same amount of time, an hour. And without, the, without, without those uh, aspects of physical classes, and I, I, am, I have uh, more freedom to rest and right. do other things. So of course, that being said, uh, studying at home presents some, difficult, some difficulties too. I think the most important one is recognizing the boundary between student and personal life. Since you will be constantly at home, it is very easy to forego one for the other. And the easiest way to avoid this complication is to prepare uh, a daily schedule and follow it to the best of your abilities. So let's not forget uh, resting, sleeping, exercising, eating, watching a series, doing our hobbies or, or whatnot. Those are all important parts of life as well. We must not overwork ourselves to preserve our physical and mental health. Uh, for group works, it is best to divide the work immediately and set a regular meeting schedule to uh, report updates and consolidate all completed tasks so far. So that can be easily overlooked nowadays as we no longer have the luxury of seeing our classmates daily and casually. Right. So finally, in general, for all students, uh, especially for those in higher education and taking an MS, uh, never be ashamed to help, to ask help from your professors. So I've witnessed this so many times over the past year. Some of my classmates tend to keep their questions to themselves and simply say nothing when the lecturer asks the class if everything is clear. They eventually say that there is a misunderstanding or misconception about the topic when it is already too late, like one or two days before an exam. So my nuclear physics professor always told us, the only stupid questions are those that you do not ask. Right. So there is no assumption from our professors or from, from any decent professor that all students in an MS program or in any uh, program, even though it's for an undergraduate, uh, there is no assumption that all students perfectly understand every subject matter. So always ask and talk to your professors if there is something unclear. May it be through a session, may it be after a session in class physically or maybe online as well, or through an email with a lengthy discussion if needed. So that's all. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Actually, the last thing that you said was very reassuring. I think that, yeah, because a lot of people when they're studying, they're very afraid to ask questions, thinking that, yeah, the professor or whoever they're asking might think that they're dumb or that they didn't yes. study enough. But yeah, that's very reassuring from the professors that you have. And I hope that all professors in the world are like that. And I hope so too. <laughs> it would really make a difference for everyone who are studying further. Okay, Um. yeah, thank you for sharing all of this knowledge that you have, all of this experience that you have. Um, I, I think I'll ask you another question to end this session with a okay. light note. <laughs> okay, since, um, I, I think you've been a lot, uh, you've, you've been doing a lot of work, but you mentioned that people 
studying at home, they should still like do the other things that they're doing, like watch series or whatever. So aside from studying, what are your hobbies? So that would be your last question for you. (laughs) uh, Before I left the Philippines, I used to have a lot of hobbies because everything was quite near. Everything is quite cheap. Here in France, everything is expensive. (laughs) <laughs> so right now I've limit uh, my hobbies are my hobbies are mainly just uh, jogging and running. Uh, I jog and run uh, every other night to give my body time to rest and recover. Uh, I'm also looking forward to swimming again. Uh, the pool is currently uh, under renovation and it was emptied out during the pandemic. Mm. So maybe in a few weeks time it will be open again to the public. There's also a tennis court nearby, so I've passed by it several times and played it, played a bit. Mm. And of course, I also watched some series when I'm bored or when I'm having when, when I need to take a break, when I need to to uh, distance myself from a while from what I'm doing. Mm. And that's it for the most part. Just running, playing tennis, and eventually, Swim. hopefully, swimming as well. Okay. Wow. You're, you're taking care of your mind and at the same time, you're training your body to be fit. I, I think that's really good. And yeah, taking time to rest, watching series from time to time. Okay, so yeah, I, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Don, for um, joining me in this session and for sharing this wonderful knowledge that you have inside your brain. And I, hopefully we could see you again in the future. I, I don't know, maybe in a year or two or maybe in 10 years. I, I don't know if I'm still doing this, but yeah, thank you very much, Don. <laughs> thank you as well for inviting me to be here. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, discussing nuclear energy and imparting knowledge about the, the industry to someone. I hope that people who, who watch this podcast will also be swayed towards the idea that nuclear energy can be safe, it can be clean, and that it would be best if we have nuclear energy whenever we can, whenever we can install it, whenever we can operate it. Yes. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you. Uh, Have a pleasant day and I'll see you soon, maybe in a year, maybe when I'm pursuing my PhD already. I'll, I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Rome is in Manila, a podcast with the pandemic as its ground zero. I am Rome Juanetas. I am not your friend yet. Listen as we transcend through space and time discussing misadventures, noise, and learnings with guests who are learning and learning and learning things. Tune in. Stop being a stranger. Be a friend.